Frank Kimbler, a geology and earth science teacher at the New Mexico Military Institute, spends considerable time searching the area of the alleged UFO crash near Roswell, New Mexico. Frank has recovered mysterious metals from the area, and he recently appeared on Nat Geo's show, Chasing UFOs. We'll talk with Frank about his experience on the show and about his mysterious metals. Moraine and I will also talk about UFOs at the Olympics, Will Shatner versus Will Wheaton, and other space and UFO news right now on Spacing Out. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Spacing Out. I'm Jason McClellan. And I'm Marie Ellsbury. Thanks for joining us. Our guest on today's show is Frank Kimbler. Our interview with Frank is coming up, but first, let's talk some news. AMC has ordered a pilot episode for a scripted dramatic television series about the secretive military installation in Nevada known as Area 51. And the basis for the show will be... Annie Jacobson's book, Area 51, an uncensored history of America's top secret military base. Jacobson reportedly interviewed more than 19 men who worked at Area 51 for her book that explores the myths about the area and those who believe that region is home to aliens, underground tunnels, systems, and nuclear facilities, according to The Hollywood Reporter. This book, published in May 2011, met with harsh criticism because of many questionable assertions made by Jacobson. Most notably was the inclusion of an explanation for what crashed near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. She claims an anonymous witness informed her that the crash recovered at Roswell was actually an advanced German aircraft, and that the bodies recovered from the crash were children that had been mutilated by the infamous Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele. The craft was allegedly ordered over the U.S. by Joseph Stalin, hoping to trick Americans into thinking it was an extraterrestrial spacecraft which would result in mass panic similar to the one caused by the 1938 radio broadcast of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. Many doubt the veracity of this Roswell story, including ABC reporter Bill Weir. Weir also interviewed this anonymous witness, but says the witness asserts he did not make all of the claims laid out in the book. The former Area 51 employees interviewed by Jacobson have also stated how they feel betrayed, and they feel that certain fictitious elements, including the Roswell story, were added to bolster book sales. The controversy surrounding Jacobson and her book doesn't seem to bother AMC, however, and the cable network has even tapped Jacobson to serve as a co-producer of the show. Walking Dead executive producer Gail Ann Hurd will reportedly executive produce, and Toddy Kessler, the good wife, will create the screenplay. The Hollywood Reporter describes that Area 51, the show, will take place in the 1950s to 1960s and will focus on those who work at the base and protect the country's secrets, including the remains of the alleged alien crash at Roswell. It's unfortunate to see that they're going with Jacobson on this because of uh, the, basically the character she's displayed in the past. And, uh, you know, I, I have my personal feelings about her. I think it's unfortunate they're going this route. And especially since, it, you know, it hasn't even been a decade since the government has come forward and acknowledged Area 51 even exists. But since that's happened, many people who worked at Area 51 have come forward to share their stories of what they did at the base, what took place at the base, and shared those stories with the National Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas. And they've put together this great Area 51 exhibit. And it seems that would be a better source of information for putting this TV show together, but who knows. Right. And, and the, the, again, the sad part about this is that a lot of the witnesses have come forward and said that the, pretty much the last chapter of a book that covers this, Roswell, ruined the entire book because they feel betrayed of, of what she said and that they say that they had never covered that sort of aspect. And I was actually really super excited when I saw the first post about this. I saw AMC, Walking Dead, which I love that show. And then further on, Annie Jacobson. And I was oh, like, wow. ah, it took the wind out of my sails. But so we'll see. And hopefully they put it together well and don't focus too much on that aspect. Yeah, it's it, 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 again, that's another added unfortunate thing that they're, they did mention in the article that they are going to include the Roswell bit from the book. And that's the most notorious part of this whole thing. But we'll see. I mean, it is television. We'll see how it all comes together. A recent study concluded that 2011 was a near record year for UFO sighting reports in Canada. The Winnipeg-based group Ufology Research tracks UFO sighting reports in Canada and data published in their 2011 Canadian UFO survey shows that there were 986 sightings reported during 2011. 
This number is just shy of the record of 1,004 reports set in 2008. The Daily Mail explains that the majority of sightings were simply streetlights or aircraft. But the study concluded that many people continue to report unusual objects in the sky, and some of these objects do not have obvious explanations. In fact, the study found that approximately 11 percent of the 986 reported sightings from 2011 are unexplained. According to the report, many witnesses are pilots, police, and other individuals with reasonably good observing capabilities and good judgment. The study suggests several possible explanations for the increase in the number of UFO sightings. More UFOs are present and physically observable by witnesses. More secret or classified military exercises and overflights are occurring over populated areas. More people are unaware of the nature of conventional or natural objects in the sky. More people are taking the time to observe their surroundings. More people are able to report their sightings with easy access to the internet and portable technology, or even that the downturn in the economy is leading to an increased desire by some people to look skyward for assistance. The group behind the study concludes that the rise in the number of UFO sighting reports suggests a need for further examination of the phenomenon by social, medical, and or physical scientists. Okay, well, and I think that they gave their reasons for this increase of sightings, and we're seeing this in the U.S. too, and I think it's basically a combination of all of those factors. Yeah, that's probably right, and I think a, a great thing that studies like this point out, and, and in Canada, it's more so than in the United States. I think in the United States, we, you know, I, I like to say that 95 percent of sightings can be explained. There's that 5 percent remaining, but this study found 11 percent, and that's remarkable. I mean, these studies show, yes, there are plenty of UFOs in the sky that can be explained. We can identify them and get rid of that you, that unidentified. Mm -hmm. But it's that remaining percent, the fact that again and again we can document that there's this percentage. It doesn't matter how small it is. There's still a percentage of sightings that cannot be explained, and that indicates there's something here worth researching. Well, and I think that that's, that's the, you're hitting the nail on the head with that it's, we have to sort of identify these 90% of the sightings that can be explained, 95%, because that makes those 5% more compelling. But again, we see studies like this quite a bit lately, so. Unfortunately, uh, you know, when these studies happen, they do catch media attention, and this one caught a lot of media mm -hmm. attention, picked up by a lot, of, a lot of mainstream media. So that's good, and that uh, increases public awareness as well. A UFO appeared above Olympic Park Stadium in Stratford, East London on Friday, July 27th during the Olympics opening ceremony fireworks display. Technically, it occurred on Saturday because the sighting took place approximately at 12.30 a.m. But Approximately one billion people reportedly watched the opening ceremony either on television, on the web, or in person. And it didn't take long for the internet to erupt with chatter about the UFO. This unidentified craft is visible in videos from media cameras covering the event, as well as in countless videos from cell phone cameras and personal video cameras taken by onlookers. But a video from the Telegraph garnered the most attention as it provides one of the best views of the craft slowly f floating over the fireworks display. Although some have described the UFO as metallic and saucer-shaped, its behavior and appearance bear a strong resemblance to a blimp, and more specifically, a Goodyear blimp. As the Daily Mail explains, NBC Olympics, a division of NBC Sports, has picked Goodyear blimps for all its 2012 Olympic aerial coverage. But oddly, the Daily Mail goes on from there to say that the object does not look like one of the floating airships. Goodyear blimps have an easily identifiable blue stripe that runs along the blimp's side. The unidentified craft seen over the fireworks also appears to have a stripe running along its side. Now, Frank Warren of the website The UFO Chronicles pointed out an additional piece of evidence to support the blimp theory. Goodyear's blimp website. The site features blimp photos submitted by users in their Spot the Blimp section. And it just so happens that users have submitted photos of the blimp flying over the Olympic Park Stadium. The resemblance to the object in this video is striking. And it's so striking because it is the Goodyear blimp. It is the blimp. It was no secret that it was the blimp. Um, th there was no doubt um, in my mind when I first saw it, the behavior and the appearance did look like a blimp. And the blimp appeared in, you know, there were so many people there. There were so many photos, so many videos right. of this event. So you could look at different angles, different uh, resolutions, and see the blimp. And beyond that, Goodyear even, they published their schedule when, when the blimp is going to be out and where it's going to be. And they had announced they were going to be there. And after all these headlines went crazy about a UFO at the Olympics, Goodyear was even tweeting right. that, oh, this is funny, all the pr problems we, we caused. Once again, we're mistaken for a UFO. Yeah. And 
like I think I was talking to you earlier today, there's still so many people online that are like, no, it doesn't look like a blimp. And in comparison, if you put it, Goodyear came out saying that the reason why it doesn't technically look like such that spot on Goodyear blimp is because they had to turn off the light, the lit signs um, because they are not technically a sponsor right. of the Olympics. So that's why you got a little dark and you didn't see that the Goodyear on the side. But you can still, even in the lowest resolution videos, you can see that there's a stripe going along yeah. the side of it. And the shape and the movement is, is pretty clear. Yep. And again, we pointed this out before, it doesn't matter how much evidence you provide some people, they're going to believe whatever they want to believe. But in this case, it was definitely the Goodyear blimp. <laughs> In space news this week, a team of researchers set out to find solar systems shaped like ours. And using data from NASA's planet hunting Kepler Space Telescope, they succeeded. The Christian Science Monitor explains that the three planets in the Kepler 30 star system all orbit in the same plane lined up with the rotation of the star, just like the planets in our own solar system do. These three planets, Kepler 30b, Kepler 30c, and Kepler 30d, are not only larger than Earth, but two are even more massive than our largest planet, Jupiter. That's gigantic. Yeah, huge. Yeah, but it was interesting when this story broke, um, it seemed a lot of people were reporting that our twin solar system had been discovered or a mirror image of our own solar system. And that's not accurate in this case. It, you know, the system doesn't have as many planets as ours does. It had three planets, I, I think. And uh, so it, it's just similar in the way the planets orbit their right. star. Conditioned in their sort of ha habitable kind of right. area. But this story is just another example of how we're always finding new things about our solar system, how exciting our, our, our universe is, and uh, how almost daily we're discovering things that we didn't know before. Mm -hmm. NASA's Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover is scheduled to touch down on Mars at 10.30 p.m. Pacific time on August 5th. And just days before this landing, two former Star Trek actors narrated a NASA video describing Curiosity's entry, descent, and landing sequence, known as the Seven Minutes of Terror. William Shatner, who played Captain James T. Kirk on the original Star Trek series, and Will Wheaton, who played Ensign Wesley Crusher on Star Trek The Next Generation, both took turns narrating the same video. But who did it better? That's a matter of personal preference, but if you want to know what other people think, you can go to Wired.com to vote for your favorite and to see how others have voted. Who so, is your favorite? Well, because the, the video is the exact same video and everything. I watched both of them, and I do like Will Wheaton, however, I'm going to say Shatner topped this one. All right. Well, I, I do like Shatner's flow, and I like how he usually narrates. But I don't know. I, I think he lacked his usual energy in this one. And I don't know. His, vo his voicing might have been a little better, but I am a Will Wheaton fan and, and certainly a Star Trek The Next Generation fan, so that, that got my vote there. Okay. But well, it is a fun video to watch, and it's even more fun with these former Star Trek actors doing the voicing. And we're very excited about the landing of Curiosity happening very soon. So watch the video, and uh, they give you a rundown of this seven minutes of terror. It's pretty exciting. With Curiosity's approaching Mars landing, there is much attention on the search for life on the red planet. But many scientists believe Saturn's moon Enceladus is a better place to look. This tiny icy world is only 310 miles in diameter, but some consider it the best place to look for extraterrestrial life in our solar system. Astrobiologist and Professor Charles Cockle of Edinburgh University is one scientist who would rather send a probe to Enceladus than Mars or any of Jupiter's moons. He believes that primitive bacteria-like life forms may indeed exist on these worlds, but they are probably buried deep under the surfaces and will be difficult to access. On Enceladus, if there are life forms, they will be easy to pick up and they will be pouring into space. As The Guardian explains, NASA's Cassini spacecraft is responsible for the recent interest in Enceladus. The probe discovered that the moon has an atmosphere and that geysers of water are erupting from its surface into space. But the probe's most recent discovery shows that these geysers contain complex organic compounds, including propane, ethane, and acetylene. NASA astrobiologist Chris McKay tells The Guardian that Enceladus is the perfect place to look for life. It has got liquid water, organic material, and a source of heat. It is hard to think of anything more enticing short of receiving a radio signal from aliens on Enceladus telling us to come to them, McKay explains. This moon seems like the perfect place to send a sample collecting mission. And although 
proposals for the mission to Enceladus are in the works. Any mission to this icy moon will require quite a bit of patience. Any such mission will take reportedly 30 years to complete. So for now, Mars will have to do, and as I've said before, that's okay with me. I'm really excited <laughs> about Mars. There's so many missions underway with Mars. We've got Curiosity landing there in just a couple days. So hopefully I, that goes well. I mean, ideally all these places would be excellent to search for oh, life. Yeah. Just probably not gonna happen all in our lifetime. But I think we're gonna find some exciting things uh, on Mars and as well as the Cassini is providing data all the time that's really interesting. Yep, very exciting stuff going on in space. Now let's talk with our guest today, Frank Kimbler. We are happy to be joined by Mr. Frank Kimbler. Frank, thanks for joining us on the show today. Oh, so Mr. Frank Kimbler, I love that. It makes me sound <laughs> old. Uh, I've, I've got to, yeah, I've got to kind of sweeten you up there, see how it goes. Oh, that'll work. That's so, just fine. So, Frank, you were recently uh, on the show Chasing UFOs on National Geographic, and you took the team out to the Roswell crash site. Uh, so I'm curious, they didn't show a lot of um, what you guys did out there. Um, what did they show? And more importantly, what didn't they show that we should know about? Well, I tell you what they did show. What they did show was they showed the use of the metal detectors out there. Um, they, um, they showed quite a bit of the metal detection work that was done. What they didn't show, uh, probably the important part, they put out a lot of, um, uh, it was Ben McGee, uh, they did some radioactive surveys out there, and they had it all surveyed out with the tapes and everything. Now, they, they have that mentioned out on their website, and uh, Ben McGee talks about that. But they left that piece out. Um, they left uh, – they didn't talk too much about the piece of metal that was found there, although I think they showed that discovery. Uh, they were using my metal detector uh, when they found it, and I was walking along with them when they, uh, when they made that discovery up there. And uh, we had a lot of conversations in reference to that particular piece of sheet metal, which is what it looked like that was there. And then, and then I left uh, because it was getting dark and it was cold and I, there wasn't much more that I could do. And then they, they started doing some of their night scenes with their, uh, with their flare, their, uh, their infrared and their little dancey cameras that hang off the top of their heads, which I thought was kind of And neat. whispering and night voice because you have oh, to whisper at night. Oh, you have to whisper. That's right. Well, you know what? You could scream out there. I don't think anyone would ever hear you. <laughs> so, so, yes. uh, so they showed that. And, and then that button thing, um, you know, I, I, I have to call it the way I see it. I, I don't, and, and I, I hate to say this, but I, I think the button might've been planted. I don't know. And I'm going to hear some flack for people that are, they're watching this. Um, Unless they got really, really lucky out there. I know that, that I've spent hours and hours and hours metal detecting in that field. And there are days where I have found nothing. And there are other times where I have found uh, basically, you know, pieces of metal and tin and things like that that are out there. And, and stuff that I've, I've presented and, and had, had analyzed. Um, to find something as fast as they did, I, I doubt it. I, I just have my doubts about it because, like I said, that I've gone. I was out there yesterday, and I was out there all day long. About died in the heat, and I found basically a couple of little pieces of barbed wire that was way off over on the side somewhere, and that's all I found. And that was I spent two hours before I found anything. When I saw it, I, you know, my my initial thought was Frank already found buttons. This isn't anything <laughs> new. You found your own buttons there before. Oh, oh, they did. Well, see, that's one thing. I showed them the buttons, and they photographed it. And they talked about the buttons a little bit. They did not bring, they didn't show the buttons. They didn't show the plastic. They didn't show a lot of the things that they, that they filmed basically on the, on the top of the car when I pulled out the, uh, the specimens. They, they sort of went by the wayside and kind of went their own way with that, which, which was really kind of sad in a way because I like the, the comment that the LA Times made. They basically said it was uh, a lot of Mulder and not enough Scully, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. And, and that sort of fits the picture of, they kind of left the science part like by the wayside, and I won't say who, but there are people on people's great good English there. There are people on the show that mentioned that to me as well. Um, I'd like to bring up something if I can in reference to the uh, the isotope work uh, that I had done previously. Uh, those folks, basically National Geographic, they agreed to have some additional analysis done, and that was supposed to be done at uh, UC Davis, I believe, at a at a top notch lab there. 
And uh, the scientist that was going to do it is one of the best in the world. They, they, we set up a conference call. The conference call never happened. Uh, they, uh, um, they, meaning the National Geographic folks, um, didn't want to follow uh, chain of custody protocols for it. They said they couldn't afford to fly me out to have the analysis done. I didn't want to give them a piece of the material, basically, to have, have it set in their office for days on end or even weeks or months. Odd thing is, the person that set this up said that the uh, lab said that they needed like a month to do the testing. And I know that's not true. It would take them maybe a day to calibrate it and a day to run the test. It doesn't take a month to do that. And they have a bunch of undergraduates sitting around with this stuff sitting in a lab. It's, I, I, I said no, uh, that it's not going to happen, and not unless they follow the right protocols. And I agreed. I said, hey, you know, if we'll sign papers and have people that just sign off on this, have your legal department draw it up. I will be more than delighted to do this, but guess what? They wouldn't do it. So that whole scientific aspect of this went by the wayside, and it left me kind of I – I was sad um, because the show, if either way, I wanted some good science done, and if they would have proved it right or wrong, if they would have proved it, it would have been a big thing saying, hey, we got extraterrestrial material here. Or, or if they even would have come back and said that, uh, hey, you know what, what he found was Mr. Rancher's you know, tin can or something, I would have been happy either way because I'm a scientist. But it would have been good for the show, and they just didn't do that. So that was, that was the part, that, for, part I didn't like. The entertainment factor, well, it's just like uh, the rest of them that are out there, like Destination Truth. Uh, matter of fact, it's kind of filmed on that same format and some of the other ones. It sort of fits in line with that. They just don't do en- enough good science on that show, and that's – the entertainment factor is great, and maybe that makes for good viewing, but not for good science, if that makes sense to you. Right. You know, and you, so you originally had these uh, metal samples tested, what was it, in 2011 or 2010 that you 2000. discovered? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you kind of discovered that there was compounds that weren't really making sense that it appeared to not be anything earthly, correct? Well, here's what happens. There's things called isotope ratios. When I had that work originally done, um, the isotope ratios were off. Uh, They were off the charts, in fact. But uh, I showed, I sort of released the information out there without getting it uh, peer approved, so to speak. It's always nice to have other scientists look at it. And uh, when I had that work done and put it out there, I, I, I basically said, hey, there's either analytical error or this thing's not from Earth. That's exactly what I said. I still stand by that. Uh, um, it's at the very edge of the analytical part of the machines. It's just inside their error factor, but it's way outside of where it should be. And I've mentioned this to a lot of people, and they said, okay, that's, uh, you need to get more testing done, which is where it still stands. Now, I had another piece analyzed recently that was a little different in composition, and it came back with the same results, except this time we, re- uh, we ran um, um, uh, a standard right side by side. The analytical error of the machine was, was .0005. It was like, like way, way close. That one still came out to be a little bit off when we look at the isotopes. It's not where it should be. Um, Giving you a little science on this, if you look at the U.S. Geological Survey work that that they do on isotopes that are earthly, uh, there's a thing called – there's a a a delta deviation from the norm, which is for everything on Earth, it's plus or minus three. It doesn't deviate any more or any less than that. It's just right in that realm somewhere. Well, the specimen that I've had analyzed basically is plus or minus seven, which basically it's, it's, it's twice what it should be, and it shouldn't be there. Now, we're talking natural things that they did their work on. Uh, there might be some metallurgical processes that cause this stuff to have some weird isotopes, but I don't think so. That's why we still need more work done on this, and I would love to have one of the TV shows out there do this the right way and, and get me some answers. I still get emails to this day asking for follow-up, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to know, asking about what's going on with Frank Kimbler's medals. So there are people I, very interested out there. I know there are people interested, in, and I want to get more more stuff done. And, and I will probably uh, – the UFO, International UFO Museum in Roswell, those people are great. Uh, they've paid for almost – well, they've paid for all the analysis that's been done, and I think maybe what I need to do is hit them up and have them do another one, which will probably be literally in the in – the, the one I want to have done at UC Davis is 
probably going to be one or two thousand dollars to get it done. But you know what? It'll give us an answer. It'll say yay or nay for sure. Uh, at least it should. Um, and that's what I would. That's what I'd like to do and get right. done. Yeah. Well, Frank, I've got to give you credit. I mean, I, I respect your scientific integrity here and your desire to do this the right way. You know, you got initial testing done, but you know, scientifically, you said that's not enough. I need to have it, additional testing to back this up. And you have tried to do that. And, and obviously, the Nat Geo testing didn't work out. But, you know, hopefully, some other testing does work out because this is incredible mm -hmm. stuff. Well, I would love, I would love to have it nationally televised, good or bad. You know what? I'm, I'm not one of these persons going to, I'm not, I don't consider myself a promoter. I'm, I'm, you know, I put, matter of fact, I'm going to put the latest analysis out on my website and uh, that's the, uh, the geosites.net uh, slash roswell.htm. And uh, I, I'm going to put that, I'll probably put it out today or tomorrow and make sure it's out there. But I, I wanted to have a group look at the analysis. There's some people that are scientists and engineers before I put it out just to make sure that I'm not uh, making boastful claims about, hey, I've got another anomaly here, and this is about to drive me to the brink of insanity because I can't get anybody to believe that this stuff is 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 otherworldly. And, and I have my own doubts. I'm my worst critic. Let's put it this way. And that's probably a good thing uh, because, I, like I said, I'm not a promoter. I'm not trying to promote this anyway. I just want to get an answer and find out what this stuff is. You know, I found a bullet out there, the 50 caliber, which is uh, out. I've got a picture of that. I thought that was kind of neat. I had Kevin Randall. I showed it to Kevin Randall. He says, well, bullet doesn't mean anything. It just, it's just it's, that uh, people shoot all the time. I says, well, 50 caliber is a little close to the windmill that was out there. I wouldn't want to have my cattle uh, having stray 50 calibers, which would basically blow the poor cow apart if it ever hit them. So. Uh, and it's an old one. It, I, where it came from, you know, it conjures up visions of, oh, my God, were they shooting at aliens out there back in the 1940s or something? But it, you, you never know what, what it is. It was just kind of a unique find. So, uh, yeah. But no more buttons, and I have found some additional pieces of metal out there as well, aluminum fragments. So uh, at least I think it's aluminum, and, and it all still needs to be tested. I've, I've got about 20 fragments right now from out there over the course of a couple of years worth of looking. So. And you're continuing and, your search, huh? You're still still out there. I'm looking, and I'm looking a lot. Other people apparently are looking too, because I was out there yesterday, and I did see some evidence that some people had been doing a little bit of digging. Which, mm -hmm. um, anytime you get stuff out, and it shows like on the internet or on TV, which is okay. We just don't want the. I don't, I'd, I'd hate to see the place contaminated, and it's right now. It's pretty yeah, pristine. It works pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it is pretty hard to find out there too, though. I've been out there, and it's out in the boonies. So <laughs> uh, it is. It Luckily, is. that will you know deter quite a few people that don't know where it's at to you know stay off yeah. the land. And there's not too many people that go out there. I think it works pretty good. All right. Well, I'm excited to, to read new stuff and, and, and hope, hopefully good, good luck. I hope something comes through with testing. But uh, we'll definitely post the link to, mm -hmm. to the website um, in the description with this episode so people can go and check that out. And, cool. uh, yeah, Frank, we'll have to have you on again after more testing is done. I'm, not, I'm, I'm optimistic. I know that testing is going to come soon, so we'll keep mm -hmm. our fingers crossed for you. Yeah, i got lots of people that are asking for it, so I, it, it'll get there. It will definitely get there. The interest awesome. is definitely there, mm -hmm. and it could potentially be huge. So, All righty. All right, Frank. Thanks, thanks so thanks much. Appreciate it. Oh, and I appreciate being on your show. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Our pleasure. You guys have a good Bye-bye. On this show, we like to highlight events we think you'll be interested in, like these. The 2012 MUFON Symposium takes place this weekend, August 3rd through the 5th, at the Northern Kentucky Convention Center in Covington, Kentucky. This year they pose the question, UFOs, friend or foe? Do we know what they are? And if they are not from here, then where are they from and why are they here? You can see the speaker list and find out more at 2012symposium.mufon.com. The San Diego Astronomy Association presents the Julian Starfest 2012, August 16th through the 19th at the Mangini Winery in Julian, California. The event features speakers, vendors, star viewing parties, and more. There's on-site camping for this event. Find out how to register and other information at julianstarfest.com. And don't forget the 2013 International UFO Congress, which is the largest annual UFO conference in the world, will take place this coming February. If you register before September 1st, you can take advantage of our special super early bird rates. Find out more at ufocongress.com. 
That's all for this episode of Spacing Out. Be sure to visit openminds.tv for all the latest news. And remember, if you'd like to submit a photo, video, or anything else to the show, you can always email us at contact at openminds.tv. And we'll consider your submission for inclusion on a future episode. Thanks for joining us this week. Next week, we'll have an exciting interview with Jeff Notkin, host of the show Meteorite Men. I'm Marina Ellsbury. And I'm Jason McClellan. We will see you in the future.